Hello and welcome to another episode of the Synapse e-learning series. With us today we have Dr. Pierre Lul, a senior gastroenterologist at the um, Mother Day Hospital in Malta and also a lecturer at the University of Malta. Uh, Dr. Lul, thank you for accepting our invitation and thank welcome you. to the show. Um, today we'll be speaking about celiac disease, allergies and food intolerance. In the past few months and years, these subjects have been ex- uh, receiving more exposure and there seems to be some sort of mix-up between celiac disease, allergies, food intolerance. What can you comment about the similarities and the differences in these subjects? I think what is one of the most important uh, factors is that um, whenever a patient has got symptoms secondary to a particular area of the bowel, very often those symptoms are going to be similar no matter what the underlying diagnosis is. So if there's a part of the small bowel which is involved, very often um, it can be, the pathology can be, uh, can be multiple pathologies can be affecting it. However, the symptoms can be very similar. Similarly, if there's a patho- different pathologies which can affect the colon, can cause similar, um, similar symptoms. So I think that one of the most, first of all, important steps always when tackling these issues um, is getting a very good history from the patient. Um, because that would not substitute it for anything. Secondly, um, age is also um, a very important factor. Diseases or conditions that affect someone who's in his late teens or early 20s um, would be probably be different from someone who's um, in late 60s and 70s because obviously there are certain different priorities that um, take place at the different, uh, different age groups. I think one of the most important things to rule out when patients present with symptoms suggestive of um, celiac disease um, is just doing a simple blood test for celiac disease. Nowadays we've got very good blood tests um, which are antibody testing and they've got a very high specificity and high sensitivity of above 97, 98, 98%. So in the instance that they come back as normal uh, the chance that the patient has got celiac disease is highly unlikely. Uh, it is extremely important that these blood tests are performed whilst the patient is on a normal gluten diet. That means he's not on a gluten-free diet. And I'm saying this because obviously if one removes the gluten from the diet, then the likelihood is that these antibody levels will go down. So when one does the blood test, they can be falsely negative. Furthermore, if you would want someone would want to repeat those blood tests at a later stage, then um, asking the patient again to start um, having a good intake of gluten might cause a bit of problems to the patients in terms of symptoms. I'm saying this because obviously gluten can cause a lot of different symptoms um, in a lot of different people. Um, some can be a kind of an exaggerated response, and some of the patients can be celiac. So, for example, patients who got or suffer from irritable bowel syndrome are known to do well as well on a gluten-free diet. And this is basically because when gluten is broken down, it causes a lot of um, it is digested by certain bacteria and produces a lot of gases within the intestine, so it gives the sensation and feeling of bloating. And so the gluten within the patient's diet um, is eliminated and patients with, for example, irritable bowel syndrome are going to feel better. Like similarly, patients with celiac disease, if they're on a gluten-free diet, they're going to feel better as well. Um, Nowadays as well, there's obviously the the big question mark, I believe, on uh, food intolerance and food allergies. What I would feel comfortable talking about is obviously food intolerance and food allergies in adults rather than uh, rather than children food allergies and intolerance in adults are uh, not common and it's very important that before one goes on a specific diet one that does have or has a real consultation so, so that more importantly one needs to rule out more important underlying conditions then if one is going to do a food intolerance testing, um, these need to be specific tests. Um, we're scientifically, we're still limited in the types of tests that we have available. And for example, the blood, the blood tests need to be specific blood tests, need to be IgE based. And still over there, there might not be, one might not really get a, um, a diagnosis in terms of 
um, a food allergy or, or a food intolerance by these tests and one might necessitate even further testing by means of skin testing which might help um, one in clinching the diagnosis of celiac disease. More specifically, doing tests which are IgG based are of little or of no or, or of no value in getting a diagnosis of a food allergy or food intolerance. And I think this is one of the most important messages, and I would like to um, pass to our uh, our viewers. And in fact, you've given a comprehensive um, overview of the pathological process for these particular conditions, but. Um, from a social point of view now, uh, from your end of the spectrum when uh, meeting meeting patients, do you think that there's an increased incidence here in Malta with regards to celiac disease, with regards to these conditions, or is it just um, due to media, to the hype um, given by the media? I think um, most probably it's a, it's a multifactorial. I think, um, there are various different issues. Uh, the prevalence of celiac disease um, in studies is 1 in 100, and however, on a real day-to-day uh, -day basis, we do not have that amount of numbers um, diagnosed with celiac. So it's, yes, we're diagnosing more celiac patients probably in the past um, five, ten years, but still we're not diagnosing um, everyone. So that is one of the one of, one of the issues. And uh, for those who are diagnosing, apart from those who are yet out of the of the field, what is the burden of celiac disease? in our country right now, in society? Um, the, obviously the most important thing is um, once you die, celiac is, can affect different parts of the body. Um, but what is very important is that these people adhere extremely well to a gluten-free diet. And um, one of the, for example, the society, people might tell them, oh, you can eat something, just having a crumb a day is fine because you're not having a big volume of food. And unfortunately not. Um, unfortunately, even a crumb a day will obviously cause significant problems um, to these patients. Um, the other obviously burden uh, is that, and, uh, and the problems with these patients' encounters, obviously going to eating out, and maybe, and I don't only mean restaurant, but even maybe at other friend's house, um, obviously trying to cook completely gluten-free and making sure that um, you adhere to a gluten-free diet is not easy but it is a very important that we adhere to to this because obviously these patients if they ingest gluten they will be causing damage to their bowel. Going back to a point which you've mentioned just earlier on you've mentioned that uh, some patients unfortunately have celiac disease but have not yet been diagnosed why are we, why are we missing the diagnosis what is happening? It's a it's a very it's a very good question um, there are a lot of different reasons first of all people might say oh I've been just having these symptoms since I was a child so um, I don't need to see any, any doctor because I'm used to it. I open my bowels three times a day, and that's normal for me. But it might be, it might, it might not be normal. Um, another strategy which might increase the diagnosis of celiac disease is by ensuring that at least a minimum of first degree relatives um, are being actually diagnosed, are being actually screened for uh, for celiac. So at once. A patient is diagnosed, it's very important to screen at a minimum of the first degree relatives, that is the parents and children's brothers and sisters, um, by doing just a simple blood test. And very importantly, the relatives might not have a, um, any symptoms at all. They might be completely symptomatic, but then by just doing the blood test, they'll be positive. And that, it's, uh, it's not really the end of the whole story, because then once um, the, the blood test is positive, you would need to go for a gastroscopy and taking biopsies from the duodeno as to clinch the definitive diagnosis. So screening the patient himself, obviously you diagnose the patient, you screen the relatives, that is uh, the take home message in diagnosing and managing celiac disease. What else can you add in your concluding remark? I think, I, think more I think very importantly is that obviously once patients get symptoms they're seen to, um, before one starts a completely gluten-free diet, um, I think it's very important that you do the necessary blood tests, including just a simple CAX screen to rule it out. Um, then once you diagnose with celiac disease, I think it's very important that you adhere, the patients adhere to complete to a gluten-free diet. It's very important as well once the patient is diagnosed to have the required vaccinations, required bone density scannings, um, as to 
treat the patient holistically and then on a separate basis um, screen the relatives. Ideally, the patient will keep be monitored initially on a frequent basis, then it would be less frequent, and the patient would need to have regular blood tests depending on the situation as to ensure that the antibody levels become completely undetectable. Thank you, Dr. Alou, for your time, for Thank joining you. us today. We hope that the information which we've conveyed to you has helped you to further clarify the subject of celiac disease, allergies, food intolerance, especially here in Malta. We invite you to share this video with your professional colleagues. Thank you.